This is a TLC recording. Silas Marner by George Eliot Chapter 12 While Godfrey Cass was taking draughts of forgetfulness from the sweet presence of Nancy, willingly losing all sense of that hidden bond which at other moments galled and fretted him so as to mingle irritation with the very sunshine, Godfrey's wife was walking with slow, uncertain steps through the snow-covered Ravelo lanes, carrying her child in her arms. This journey on New Year's Eve was a premeditated act of vengeance when she had kept in her heart ever since Godfrey, in a fit of passion, had told her he would sooner die than acknowledge her as his wife. There would be a great party at the Red House on New Year's Eve, she knew. Her husband would be smiling and smiled upon, hiding her existence in the darkest corner of his heart. But she would mar his pleasure. She would go in her dingy rags, with her faded face, once as handsome as the best, with her little child that had its father's hair and eyes, and disclose herself to the squire as his eldest son's wife. It is seldom that the miserable can help regarding their misery as a wrong inflicted by those who are less miserable. Molly knew that the cause of her dingy rags was not her husband's neglect, but the demon opium to whom she was enslaved, body and soul, except in the lingering mother's tenderness that refused to give him her hungry child. She knew this well, and yet... In the moments of wretched, unbenumbed consciousness, the sense of her want and degradation transformed itself continually into bitterness towards Godfrey. He was well off, and if she had her rights, she would be well off too. The belief that he repented his marriage and suffered from it only aggravated her vindictiveness. Just and self-reproving thoughts do not come to us too thickly, even in the purest air, and with the best lessons of heaven and earth. How should those white-winged, delicate messengers make their way to Molly's poisoned chamber, inhabited by no higher memories than those of a barmaid's paradise of pink ribbons and gentlemen's jokes? She had set out at an early hour but had lingered on the road, inclined by her indolence to believe that if she waited under a warm shed, the snow would cease to fall. She had waited longer than she knew, and now that she had found herself belated in the snow-hidden ruggedness of the long lanes, even the animation of a vindictive purpose could not keep her spirit from failing. It was seven o'clock, and by this time she was not very far from Ravelo, but she was not familiar enough with those monotonous lanes to know how near she was to her journey's end. She needed comfort, and she knew but one comforter, the familiar demon in her bosom, but she hesitated a moment, after drawing out the black remnant before she raised it to her lips. In that moment, the mother's love pleaded for painful consciousness rather than oblivion, pleaded to be left in aching weariness rather than to have the encircling arms be numbed so that they could not feel the dear burden. In another moment, Molly had flung something away, but it was not the black remnant. It was an empty file, and she walked on again under the breaking cloud from which there came now and then the light of a quickly veiled star, for a freezing wind had sprung up since the snowing had ceased, but she walked always more and more drowsily, and clutched more and more automatically the sleeping child at her bosom. Slowly the demon was working his will, and cold and weariness were his helpers, Soon she felt nothing but a supreme, immediate longing that curtained off all futurity, the longing to lie down and sleep. She had arrived at a spot where her footsteps were no longer checked by a hedgerow, and she had wandered vaguely, 
unable to distinguish any objects, notwithstanding the wide whiteness around her and the growing starlight. She sank down against a straggling furze bush, an easy pillow enough, and the bed of snow too was soft. She did not feel that the bed was cold, and did not heed whether the child would wake and cry for her, but her arms had not yet relaxed their instinctive clutch, and the little one slumbered on as gently as if it had been rocked in a lace-trimmed cradle. But the complete torpor came at last. The fingers lost their tension, the arms unbent. Then the little head fell away from the bosom, and the blue eyes opened wide on the cold starlight. At first, there was a little peevish cry of Mammy, and an effort to regain the pillowing arm and bosom. But Mammy's ear was deaf and the pillow seemed to be slipping away backward. Suddenly, as the child rolled downward on its mother's knees, all wet with snow, its eyes were caught by a bright glancing light on the white ground, and with the ready transition of infancy, it was immediately absorbed in watching the bright living thing running towards it, yet never arriving. That bright living thing must be held up to see where the cunning gleam came from. It came from a very bright place, and the little one, rising on its legs, toddled through the snow, the old grimy shawl in which it was wrapped trailing behind it, and the queer little bonnet dangling at its back, toddled on to the open door of Silas Marner's cottage and right up to the warm hearth where there was a bright fire of logs and sticks, which had thoroughly warmed the old sack, Silas's greatcoat, spread out on the bricks to dry. The little one, accustomed to be left to itself for long hours without notice from its mother, squatted down on the sack and spread its tiny hands towards the blaze in perfect contentment, gurgling and making many inarticulate communications to the cheerful fire, like a new-hatched gosling, beginning to find itself comfortable. But presently the warmth had a lulling effect, and the little golden head sank down on the old sack, and the blue eyes were veiled by their delicate half-transparent lids. But where was Silas Marner while this strange visitor had come to his hearth? He was in the cottage, but he did not see the child. During the last few weeks, since he had lost his money, he had contracted the habit of opening his door and looking out from time to time, as if he thought that his money might be somehow coming back to him, or that some trace, some news of it, might be mysteriously on the road, and be caught by the listening ear or the straining eye. It was chiefly at night, when he was not occupied in his loom, that he fell into this repetition of an act for which he could have assigned no definite purpose, and which can hardly be understood except by those who have undergone a bewildering separation from a supremely loved object. In the evening twilight, and later whenever the night was not dark, Silas looked out on that narrow prospect round the stone pits, listening and gazing, not without hope, but with mere yearning and unrest. This morning he had been told by some of his neighbors that it was New Year's Eve, and that he must sit up and hear the old year rung out and the new rung in, because that was good luck and might bring his money back again. This was only a friendly Ravelo way of jesting with the half-crazy oddities of a miser, but it had perhaps helped to throw Silas into a more than usually excited state. Since the oncoming of twilight, he had opened his door again and again, though only to shut it immediately at seeing all distance veiled by the falling snow. But the last time he opened it, the snow had ceased, 
and the clouds were parting here and there. He stood and listened, and gazed for a long while. There was really something on the road coming towards him then, but he caught no sign of it, and the stillness and the wide trackless snow seemed to narrow his solitude, and touched his yearning with the chill of despair. He went in again, and put his right hand on the latch of the door to close it, but he did not close it. He was arrested, as he had been already since his loss, by the invisible wand of catalepsy, and stood like a graven image, with wide but sightless eyes, holding open his door, powerless to resist either the good or the evil that might enter there. When Marner's sensibility returned, he continued the action which had been arrested, and closed his door, unaware of the chasm in his consciousness, unaware of any intermediate change, except that the light had grown dim, and that he was chilled and faint. He thought he had been too long standing at the door and looking out. Turning towards the hearth, where the two logs had fallen apart, and sent forth only a red uncertain glimmer, he seated himself on his fireside chair, and was stooping to push his logs together when, to his blurred vision, it seemed as if there were gold on the floor in front of the hearth. Gold, his own gold, brought back to him as mysteriously as it had been taken away. He felt his heart begin to beat violently, and for a few moments he was unable to stretch out his hand and grasp the restored treasure. The heap of gold seemed to glow and get larger beneath his agitated gaze. He leaned forward at last, and stretched forth his hand, but instead of the hard coin with the familiar resisting outline, his fingers encountered soft, warm curls. In utter amazement, Silas fell on his knees and bent his head low to examine the marvel. It was a sleeping child, a round, fair thing, with soft yellow rings all over its head. Could this be his little sister come back to him in a dream? His little sister whom he had carried about in his arms for a year before she died, when he was a small boy without shoes or stockings? That was the first thought that darted across Silas's blank wonderment. Was it a dream? He rose to his feet again, pushed his logs together, and, throwing on some dried leaves and sticks, raised a flame. But the flame did not disperse the vision. It only lit up more distinctly the little round form of the child and its shabby clothing. It was very much like his little sister— Silas sank into his chair powerless, under the double presence of an inexplicable surprise and a hurrying influx of memories. How and when had the child come in without his knowledge? He had never been beyond the door, but along with that question, and almost thrusting it away, there was a vision of the old home and the streets leading to Lantern Yard, and within that vision another— of the thoughts which had been present with him in those far-off scenes. The thoughts were strange to him now, like old friendships impossible to revive, and yet he had a dreamy feeling that this child was somehow a message come to him from that far-off life. It stirred fibers that had never been moved in Ravelo, old quiverings of tenderness, old impressions of awe at the presentiment of some power presiding over his life, for his imagination had not yet extricated itself from the sense of mystery in the child's sudden presence, and had formed no conjectures of ordinary natural means by which the event could have been brought about. But there was a cry on the hearth. The child had awaked, and Marner stooped to lift it on his knee. It clung round his neck, and burst louder and louder into that mingling of inarticulate cries with Mammy, by which little children express the bewilderment of waking. Silas pressed it to him, 
and almost unconsciously uttered sounds of hushing tenderness, while he bethought himself that some of his porridge, which had got cool by the dying fire, would do to feed the child with if it were only warmed up a little. He had plenty to do through the next hour. The porridge, sweetened with some dry brown sugar from an old store which he had refrained from using for himself, stopped the cries of the little one, and made her lift her blue eyes with a wide quiet gaze at Silas, as he put the spoon into her mouth. Presently, she slipped from his knee and began to toddle about, but with a pretty stagger that made Silas jump up and follow her lest should she fall against anything that would hurt her. But she only fell in a sitting posture on the ground and began to pull at her boots, looking up at him with a crying face as if the boots hurt her. He took her on his knee again, but it was some time before it occurred to Silas's dull bachelor mind that the wet boots were the grievance, pressing on her warm ankles. He got them off with difficulty, and Baby was at once happily occupied with the primary mystery of her own toes, inviting Silas, with much chuckling, to consider the mystery too. But the wet boots had at last suggested to Silas that the child had been walking on the snow, and this roused him from his entire oblivion of any ordinary means by which it could have entered or been brought into his house. Under the prompting of this new idea, and without waiting to form conjectures, he raised the child in his arms and went to the door. As soon as he had opened it, there was the cry of Mammy again, which Silas had not heard since the child's first hungry waking. Bending forward, he could just discern the marks made by the little feet on the virgin snow, and he followed their track to the firs bushes. Mammy, the little one cried again and again, stretching itself forward so as almost to escape from Silas's arms before he himself was aware that there was something more than the bush before him, that there was a human body with the head sunk low in the firs and half covered with the shaken snow. End of chapter 12 Please click the link below to continue on to chapter 13. This has been a TLC recording. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe.